Hello everybody, welcome. It's really great to see a very nice turnout here, although I'm not surprised considering the fact that this big question of dark matter is something that keeps many people, certainly many physicists, awake at night. Um, as you probably know, there are many different experiments that are being conducted in these days, and those experiments have not really produced any confirmed uh, results, no conclusive results about what dark matter is all about. But that keeps very bright theorists such as Sebastian awake at night thinking about what other ideas can we possibly have about dark matter. So he's going to tell us about that uh, in his lecture today. Sebastian got his undergraduate degree in the UK and then continued at uh, University of Michigan and became a postdoctoral fellow with us here at Slack uh, about two and a half years ago or so. And he continues working on a variety of theoretical physics problems, but I think that the one that is most compelling is the question of what dark matter is all about. So without much more ado. Okay, so uh, thank you, Greg, for the uh, very kind introduction, and uh, thank you also to the rest of the organizers for the opportunity to uh, take part in this great tradition of giving public lectures here at Slack. Uh, so, as Greg said, you know, dark matter is a question that keeps me up at night. There's another dark matter that keeps me up at night, and that's coffee. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, so, so as you can see from the title, I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, dark matter, uh, and in particular, da dark matter that may shine. So that might seem counterintuitive, uh, but hopefully by the end of the lecture, you will come away thinking, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, so, without uh, much ado, let's get started. So, what am I, and what do physicists at Slack do? So, I'm a theorist, right? And the people here in the audience and uh, watching are interested in knowing what people at Slack do. So, I can only tell you what I, as a theorist, do. Uh, but before I get there, why don't I start with why? Uh, so, you might have this question, why on earth do I do, well, why on earth do you do what you do, talking about me? Uh, and the answer to that question comes in the form of more questions, because uh, if you can't ask, answer questions by asking more questions, we wouldn't stay in business. So the first question that I think uh, is very fundamental, but we actually have pretty good answers to, is uh, what are we? All right, so what are we made up of? Uh, and uh, I will explain what we are made up of in due course uh, over the introduction of this talk. Uh, so here are little images of... Uh, a proton, a neutron, and an electron, which make up us in the form of atoms. Um, the second fundamental question is, how did we get here? Uh, so there's obviously lots of different answers to that. Some of you might have biked, some of you might have driven. Uh, but how, in particular, did we arrive here in the history of the universe is the question that I would like to get into. Uh, so I will explain that in due course. And uh, in explaining that, I will also explain the various forces of uh, that we experience that interact, that allow the matter above to interact. Uh, and so I will explain that as well. But there are unanswered parts to this question, uh, and I will explain uh, what role dark matter plays in how we got to where we are today. Uh, then there's more of a sort of uh, existential question, which is, well, why are we here? And uh, I cannot answer that. Uh, I, if anyone here can answer that, that would be great. I'd love to hear the answer. Uh, but I would argue that dark matter has some role to play there, uh, and so hopefully we'll go some way towards answering that question as well in this talk. Uh, and finally, by the end, uh, you should get a sense of uh, where we're going, uh, right? So what does this all mean? What is this all for? What's the point? Where are we going from here? And I will tell you uh, about uh, an experiment that uh, might be a way forward uh, from where we are today. And so, as I said uh, in the course of this introduction, dark matter is going to play a crucial role in answering many of these questions, although not really the top one, because we pretty much know what we're made up of. OK, so let's start with what are we? Uh, and in order to do this, I want to start by setting the context that we're in, uh, and in particular, a scale. So uh, first, I will talk about the small. Uh, starting with us. So here's uh, us, a human, uh, order one meter tall, maybe a bit taller, a bit smaller, doesn't really matter, uh, thinking, pondering very hard about questions, about fundamental issues in the universe. Okay, and we live uh, in a scale which is larger than us. So for example, here is uh, 10,000 times larger than us is uh, 
roughly the size of a city, or in this case, also a city shown next to the Large Hadron Collider, which is one of the very large-scale experiments that uh, we, as physicists, have been conducting to try and understand all of these questions and some of the questions that I will be discussing today. Uh, and, of course, we're here on Earth, uh, which is 10 million times larger than we are, roughly speaking, uh, and here's a pretty picture of the Earth. But let's go smaller than us. Let's go smaller than a human. So uh, if you were to pluck a hair, which please don't do it, because that would probably hurt, and you looked at it head on, you would see the width of the hair, and it's visible to the naked eye, and that's roughly uh, 100,000 times smaller than you are. Okay, so this is a size that sort of makes sense to you. You can observe it, you can pluck it out, look at it, and see, okay, that is roughly the scale that is the smallest you can observe with the naked eye. But that is by far not the smaller scale that we are able to access. Indeed, uh, protons, one of the, uh, the fundamental building blocks that makes us up, uh, is actually 10 to the minus 16 meters in length. Uh, so if you think about what that means, that's uh, 10 million billion times smaller than you are is the proton that is sitting up inside of you in many, many of protons sitting inside of you. And the Large Hadron Collider, believe it or not, actually probes length scales even shorter than that proton. So it's colliding particles, protons indeed, at energies that probe length scales that are four uh, orders of magnitude even smaller than the proton itself. So that's why the Large Hadron Collider is actually associated with two scales. And finally, there's the sort of fundamental length scale of the universe, which is the Planck length, which is associated with gravity. Uh, and this is the only place where this will appear uh, here, but that's just to give you an idea of how small can you possibly go. Okay, so what about the big? So still in the logarithmic scale, we're going to start from us, the Earth, and we're going to go bigger. So uh, a little bit bigger than us, 100 times bigger is the sun. Okay, so we observe the sun, it looks pretty small, but if you sat next to it, it would be A, extremely hot, and B, very, very large. Uh, the sun, of course, sits inside our solar system, which is 1,000 times bigger yet again than the sun itself. Uh, and so we can observe this with a telescope. Probably in your backyard, you could set up a telescope and observe Saturn or Jupiter, uh, probably not uh, Pluto, uh, if you still count it as part of our solar system as a planet. Uh, but you could certainly start observing things here with a telescope. Now, taking a big leap, actually, is the difference in size between the solar system where we live and the galaxy in which our solar system lives. Uh, so that is a billion times larger than the solar system is. Even bigger than that, however, our galaxy happens to sit in a supercluster of clusters of galaxies. So in each one of these superclusters, which uh, you can roughly make out that there's little dots of light here and there, those, each one of those dots of light would actually be a galaxy. So there are big structures composed of many, many galaxies that all seem to cluster together. And through uh, this talk, I will explain exactly how these clusters came to be. Between the clusters, and indeed the clusters themselves, live in what we know as filaments. And so these are sort of uh, those uh, pretty elongated structures of clusters of galaxies that you saw on the, uh, the title slide earlier. And again, this is something that I will explain uh, during the talk. And then uh, finally, the observable universe, which is why there's an asterisk there, because we don't actually know that it's uh, this size, it's probably larger, is uh, 10 to the 27 meters long. So that's 27 zeros more than the size of us humans. OK, so that's the scale. Uh, but what are we in terms of matter? Well, we know that we are made up of protons and neutrons that bind together. Uh, but they themselves are made up of fundamental constituents known as quarks. Uh, so we're mostly made of up and down quarks, but there are additional sort of heavier siblings of those guys as well. Now these combine into nuclei. Here, for example, I'm showing the helium nucleus. Uh, and then you have to add more charged particles to make stable elements. So for example, this is helium, where I've taken two electrons and paired them up so that this thing is electrically neutral. And so these would be the, the atoms that we observe. And the electron, just like the quarks, also has sort of heavier siblings. It also has a chargeless cousin 
uh, which I will discuss in very uh, short detail later on. Now, all of these particles interact with each other, and these particles interact with each other via forces. So we know of all these forces, and we know of the most obvious one, of course, which is the, the photon. So the electromagnetic force, the way that you are able to see me, and that I am able to see you, and that we're able to see stars, is a result of exchanging photons. That is the force carrier of the electromagnetic force. It's also responsible for magnetism. So if you were to take a big magnet next to this TV and destroy it, that would be because of the exchange of photons. The next force is uh, the strong nuclear force, and that's mediated by a particle known as the gluon. So that proton and that neutron that I showed you earlier is made up of those quarks, and those quarks are bound together via this gluon. They're exchanging gluons all the time to form this composite proton object. Then there's the weak nuclear force, which is mediated by particles known as the W and Z bosons. And the Z was named because they thought that was the last particle they were going to discover. <laughs> ah, yeah, right. Uh, so this one is responsible for, for example, uh, radioactive decay. So here you see uh, a beta decay of a neutron into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. Uh, and this is what happens in uh, radioactive processes all the time. So of course, the joke with the Z being last discovered particle is that in 2012, they discovered another particle, which is another force carrier known as the Higgs boson. Uh, and that was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider. So the Higgs, I want to explain in a little bit more detail. Uh, and you can think of it as sort of being this big snow field with which particles can interact. So the photon being massless, you can think of as being like a downhill alpine skier. It's, you know, Michaela Schifrin going straight down that, uh, that slope extremely fast and not interacting with the snow field whatsoever. That's because the photon is massless. Slightly heavier particles, like the electron and the up quark, interact with the Higgs boson a little bit, quite weakly, and so they're sort of more like a, uh, a cross-country skier gliding across the snow, interacting with it just a little bit. Then heavier particles, like, for example, the W and Z bosons, interact quite a lot with the Higgs snow field. So that would be sort of like a guy with snowshoes who's sort of trotting through the snow, but making pretty good progress. And finally, the top quark, which is the heaviest particle, fundamental particle that we have discovered so far, would be like some guy who did not plan at all, took only his hiking boots, and is finding it really hard going through that snow field. OK, so that's what we are. Uh, so let's move forward to how did we get here? And in particular, the aspect of this question that I would like to discuss today is the history of the universe, and that is cosmology. That comes from, from Greek, cosmos, which is the universe, and logi, which is to do with the study of it. So here is a, a time scale starting from just 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang to now 14 giga years later. So we started with the Big Bang, and this was followed by a period of very, very rapid inflation. So the universe came to be and then just blew up, literally. Uh, it inflated very, very rapidly. This was followed by a period where all of those fundamental particles were free and just moving around in what's known as the quark-gluon plasma. And this lasted for a whopping 10 to the minus 10 seconds. After this, the protons and the neutrons and also other particles known as mesons started to form, uh, and this period happened sort of one in 10,000 seconds after the Big Bang. So things were starting to congeal. Things continued to congeal further, and nuclei began to form about one second after the Big Bang. So all of your uh, hydrogen, helium, and lithium mostly comes from this era of what's known as Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, roughly one second after the Big Bang. And now we're getting to the meat of the things that I would really like to discuss in detail, uh, which happened 300,000 to 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and that is this thing known as the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background I'll explain in a lot of detail, but it's basic basically the most ancient light in the universe, and I'll explain exactly what that means in just a moment. This was followed by a period of structure formation, which uh, the cosmic microwave background gave the seed for all of the structures, like those galaxies and clusters of galaxies and filaments that I discussed, to form over billions of years. And finally, we get to where we are today with pretty pictures of galaxies. 
Okay, and so I would like to argue that in basically all of these stages, dark matter and mattered. Okay, but in particular, I would like to discuss these last two stages of the cosmic microwave background and the influence of dark matter on structure formation. So as I just said, the cosmic microwave background is basically the most ancient light in the universe. Uh, and it's light that started shining uh, once it escaped from all of that matter about 300 to 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And as I mentioned earlier, this provided the seeds for that eventual structure formation that grew into the vast structures that we observe today. Okay, so what role does dark matter have to play in all of this story? Well, before we actually answer that question, we need to ask a different question. So you see, every question actually has the answer in the form of another question. And this question is, how do we actually observe things? All right, so you're observing me, hopefully. I'm observing you, and we do this via lights. So we're exchanging photons, right? We're, we're having a good time exchanging photons. And this can happen either through something that's shining. So for example, a galaxy just emits lots and lots of photons, and therefore you observe it because you can see all the light coming off of it. Or it can be something like me or you, the floor, the table, and it's reflecting. Or indeed, a planet reflects light. So we observe it because some very shiny object emits photons, they bounce off of it, and they come back, and we observe those. So there's lots of observational evidence in the form of light for dark matter. The most famous one, of course, is that of rotation curves. Uh, so this was due to pioneering work by Vera Rubin back in the 1970s. And she was looking at galaxies and, in particular, tracking the motion of the stars in the galaxies. And she was looking at stars in a galaxy not too dissimilar from our own and was saying, OK, well, what are the velocities of the stars in this galaxy as you get further away from the center of that galaxy? And what she expected was something like this curve here. But what she observed were these dots, maybe not exactly these dots, but dots like these that seemed to indicate that there was much more matter in that galaxy that, than what you could actually observe. And that there was just no way that the regular old matter was resulting in this, what's called the velocity rotation curve of that galaxy. And we know that because the velocity is related to the mass distribution. So if you had the regular matter distributed in the regular way, you would never get a curve that looked like this. You also get additional uh, evidence through light by looking at big clusters of galaxies and observing that, again, there seems to be a lot of matter missing from that, galaxy, from that galaxy cluster to explain why all of the different galaxies now, not just stars, are moving at the speeds that they're moving. And in fact, it just so happens that in the 1930s, a, a guy at Caltech, Fritz Vicky, had actually made this observation and had given the name dark matter to the thing that must have been there to explain these velocities. But he thought it was just regular matter and it just wasn't shining for whatever reason or its light was being absorbed. He didn't make the connection that it might be a new fundamental type of matter. Okay, so that's how we observe uh, dark matter or rather don't observe dark matter via light. How else do we observe objects? Well, we use gravity and light paired up together. So here we have a nice grid which is supposed to represent our space-time, right? So we live in space-time, and we're going to make it two-dimensional and represent it as a grid. And we have galaxies, and they're emitting photons, and those photons are just streaming across uh, that grid of space-time. Now, if we took that grid, removed our galaxies, but instead placed a big, heavy, dark object in the middle of that space-time, much like a rubber sheet, if you put a big, heavy object on it, it would deform the rubber sheet. So indeed, a big, heavy, dark object deforms our rubber sheet of space-time and makes these wonky curves in our, in our two-dimensional space-time. So now, if we were to observe some distant galaxy which is on the other side of that big, dark object from us, and we observe the light being emitted from that galaxy or cluster or whatever it may be on the other side of that dark object, that light gets deflected because it just follows the shortest path to us, which because of the deformation of space-time actually is curved rather than straight. And so this is the phenomenon known as gravitational lensing. 
So if you take a dark object and you're a little bit off axis from it, you can get, for example, smearing. So a star, instead of looking like a, a nice round point, will actually get smeared out. Or you might get duplication. Or you might get the very fancy phenomenon known as an Einstein ring, where it basically gets smeared all the way around the uh, foreground object. And so we can use gravitational lensing to infer where there is matter and then see whether that corresponds to actually observing matter or not. So that brings me to the next piece of very strong evidence for dark matter, which is the bullet cluster. So this is an animation showing a simulation of what happened when two large clusters of galaxies collided. So in blue is where lensing tells us most of the mass is, where in red is where most of the light is shining in x-rays. And what you observe is that the blue passed through very easily and didn't interact very much, whereas the red slowed down and got sort of stuck in the middle. And that's because regular matter interacts via all of those forces that we discussed earlier, and they get sort of slowed down as they pass through each other, whereas the dark matter is just not interacting and just passing straight through. So what this looks like in reality is this. So this is an observational picture of just the galaxies that we're observing in, in the bullet cluster, uh, overlaid with the actual image in x-rays in pink here of where most of the luminous matter is, the stuff that's actually, actually emitting light, and the, the sort of uh, gravitational map of where most of the matter is in blue. And you see that they're not in the same place. That can only be explained if there is dark matter in addition to regular matter that just is not interacting or interacting very, very weakly as these clusters pass through each other. The other way in which we're able to use uh, gravity and light together to tell us about dark matter is actually from the cosmic microwave background itself. So that ancient light from the universe, we've now been able to observe very, very precisely using the Planck satellite, which was sent up by the European Space Agency. So this is a map of the galaxy in the cosmic microwave background. This is actually a little bit untrue, because if you were to just look at the map of the cosmic microwave background, what you would see is a uniform temperature of 3 Kelvin, or minus 454 Fahrenheit, and it would basically just look roughly green across this entire image. So once you subtract that foreground, and you subtract all the other foregrounds that we know of, what you're left is with is these small variations of temperatures. So this is three plus or minus one part in 100,000 of three Kelvin. So little blue spots are a little bit colder than three Kelvin, little red spots are a little bit hotter than three Kelvin. And this map actually contains a huge amount of information, way more than just being a pretty picture. And indeed, a lot of that information we've obtained in part thanks to uh, the pioneering work of Jim Peebles in the 80s and later, uh, for which he was rewarded with a Nobel Prize this year. So one cool thing about the cosmic microwave background that I want to explain is that it's actually quantum mechanics in action. So OK, quantum mechanics sounds very potentially complicated, but it also sounds cool. So what do I mean by that? Well, so now I've turned our space-time into a one-dimensional line instead of that two-dimensional plane that I showed you earlier. And for the most part, it's flat, assuming that there's no heavy objects deforming it. However, small quantum fluctuations in the early universe, in fact, during that period, uh, during that period of cosmic inflation that I referred to much earlier in the talk, mean that if you were to blow up a part of your one-dimensional space-time, you would actually see this. Lots of small uh, dips and uh, mountains and dips and mountains of variations in that fundamental space-time itself. And that's just due to quantum fluctuations. So quantum mechanics tells us that it can't just be flat, it has to have small variations. And those small variations get blown up by cosmic inflation, to turn into big dips and big mountains. And of course, in big mountains what, uh, of space-time, you can think of this as like that deformation where that heavy object was sitting. And so that is going to accumulate stuff. And that stuff comes in the form of baryons, so protons and neutrons, and photons, the carriers of light. OK, so it also is going to attract dark matter. Dark matter is going to sit in those troughs of deformed space-time, 
And depending on the amount of dark matter and the size of the trough, you will accumulate more or less. And so this will result in observable di differences in uh, what the baryons do and the correlations in the temperature of that CMB map that I showed you, that cosmic microwave background map. So if we go back to this map, what our folks over at KaiPak in the next building over do is they study this early light and compute, for example, temperature correlations. So they take various different points on this map and they say, okay, what is the characteristic size of the variations of these temperatures? And what they produce for us is a very nice plot. But before I show you that plot, I'm going to tell you what you would expect to see if you saw no dark matter. So if there was no dark matter and everything was luminous matter, this is what you would observe. Something that looks like this. So most of the uh, objects that you would see in the cosmic microwave background would be roughly one degree in size. So if you think about one degree, that's maybe the size of a nearby planet in your, uh, in your um, telescope. Most, and then there are other peaks associated with other scales where there are smaller objects, but they are generally less uh, dominant than that first big peak. So this is what you would observe if there was no dark matter. But what they actually observe is the line that is underneath, or really rather the, the red dots that you see underneath there. And you see in particular that, okay, I've normalized the first peak so that they look the same, but the subsequent peaks look quite different. And this is because, of course, we have dark matter, and it's not just luminous matter in the universe. And indeed, from the data, now removing that uh, fake plot that I showed you earlier, we can actually infer from the third peak the amount of dark matter that there is in the universe. In combination with the second peak, we can also determine how much regular matter there is in the universe, so how much of you and I and stars and so on there is in the universe. And that first very big peak actually tells us something about dark energy. Uh, so I don't really want to get into dark energy during this talk because it's pretty tangential to what I want to say. Uh, but if you have questions about it, I'd be happy to answer them after the talk. So people have studied in great detail what would happen to that plot that I showed you earlier if you were to vary different parameters in the universe and to try and understand what degeneracies there might be between the amount of dark matter or the amount of dark energy or the amount of regular matter or how curved the universe is. And they can produce many other pretty pictures showing how if you introduce more or less matter, you would get higher or lower peaks. Or if you were to introduce more or less uh, regular luminous matter, that would also change the shape and so on and so forth. You see that it's not super sensitive to dark energy. So turning that plot back into the pretty picture of the colors, uh, this is what you would observe if you had different universes with different amounts of dark matter and regular matter in them. So now I'm going to ask you, as a pop quiz, which one you think corresponds to our universe. And if nobody answers, I'm going to pick on somebody. B, Any? B is our universe. Unfortunately, B is not our universe. A is our universe. So uh, A is ours, uh, B is uh, almost the same as ours but with no dark matter. Uh, C is if you took all of the dark matter and turned it into regular matter. Uh, and D and E are other variations that I've put into this simulator where you can go and simulate your own universe. Now one thing to notice here is that our universe, as we were mentioning earlier, has various different objects, so different hot and cold spots of different sizes. There's sort of a big clump here of hot, there's little clumps of hot over here, big clumps of cold, little clumps of cold, etc. You notice that that's quite different from the case where you would just have only matter instead of the dark matter, where basically all of the clumps are roughly the same size. And this will be important later when we discuss how this turns into structure formation. So what does the data actually tell us in terms of numbers? Well, it tells us that regular matter, so you and I make up about 4% of the universe. And of that, most of it is actually not visible. It's just gas in the interstellar medium. Very little is in stars, uh, a little bit less in neutrinos, those sort of very light cousins of electrons that I was mentioning earlier, uh, even less in heavy elements like what is going into my computer or your phone. 
Uh, so 0.03% of the universe is that. 27% is actually dark matter. So there's way, way more dark matter than there is regular matter in the universe. And finally, the rest of it is made up of that mysterious dark energy which I mentioned earlier. So what you'll notice from this part of the pie chart, which is the one that I'm particularly interested in, is that we basically know nothing about what the matter in the universe actually is. So 27% of the universe is a pretty good reason to stay up at night, I would say. Okay, so how does, what does this have to do with cosmic structures and their formation? Well, of course, our deformations of space-time that accumulated dark matter allow us to track the, the, uh, the evolution of these cosmic structures as a function of time. So starting from that earliest light in the cosmic microwave background, we know where there were sort of over-densities and under-densities of stuff, and therefore also of dark matter, into which our baryons are going to fall and accumulate. And that is exactly where the stars and the galaxies and the clusters are going to form. So now I'm going to show a video showing an uh, a simulation of the evolution of such structures. And you see at the very beginning, so this is starting roughly half a billion years after the Big Bang, uh, in blue here is actually just dark matter. So they haven't put in the stars yet. And you see that there's big clumps and little clumps, much the same way that in the cosmic microwave background we saw big clumps and little clumps. And as the simulation keeps going, and we're now sort of almost two billion years after the Big Bang, they're going to add a new color. And this is going to be the regular matter, which you will see will end up being in exactly the same places as the dark matter. So you can already start to see a little bit of it in this pink here. And so if we just wait a little bit longer, we should start to see more colors appearing. It's also just a very pretty video to keep watching. So here's the green. This is all the stellar matter, so all of the stars and the galaxies. And here's some nice little animations of supernovae, explosions of stars going off. And you see that those stars appeared in exactly the same places where, as where all the dark matter is. So all of the structures that we observe in the galaxy actually tracked where the dark matter was way, way earlier in the history of the universe. So, okay, let's end the animation and move on to just a static picture. So, again, a pop quiz. Which one of these do people think is a simulation and which one do people think is data? You in the front row. I don't know what the colors mean. Don't ignore the colors. Which one do you think looks like simulation? Which one do you think looks like data? <laughs> The right one is data or simulation? So this is actually exactly what someone said when I did the practice as well. This is actually the simulation. Both of these are the simulation, and these are actually the data. But what you see is, of course, that our simulation involving just dark matter, so there's no matter in this whatsoever, very well replicates exactly what we observe in the galaxies and in the, the universe that we are able to observe. And so there are these beautiful structures known as the Sloan Great Wall and uh, the CFA2 Great Wall of these filaments of uh, galaxy clusters in the universe. And that looks exactly like what we get out of simulations using just dark matter, no regular matter whatsoever. If we had actually removed some dark matter, we would get something very different. So with dark matter, here again is simulation, you observe this sort of structure up here in the top right-hand corner. So you see that there's those big clumps and then there's smaller clumps, and they're all sort of of different sizes. If you were to remove some dark matter, you start to get more or less similar sized clumps. And now finally with no dark matter, you observe that all of the clumps are about the same size. So that is to be compared with what we saw earlier in the CMB pictures, where again, you had these hierarchies in the structures of the clumps. And indeed, you see that the CMB clumping here in the absence of dark matter looks quite similar to the clumping of late time structures that we observe. And that's just because the matter tracks where the dark matter is. Okay, so having gone through a lot of evidence for the dark matter, and I've hopefully convinced you that dark matter exists, I now want to discuss what the dark matter actually is. So what is it made up of? And that is the main question that I try to answer in my research. 
So let's go back and look at those particles that we discussed way at the very beginning and say, OK, well, one by one, can any of these actually be dark matter? So the first thing is that dark matter is dark. Therefore, it doesn't really interact with photons. It might indeed not interact with photons at all. And so it should have no charge under electromagnetism, or at least very, very small charge, as you will see later. So that rules out a whole bunch of particles in the standard model as being possible dark matter candidates. Additionally, we know, and indeed I showed you the bullet cluster, that dark matter doesn't interact strongly with other dark matter, right? It just passed straight through. So therefore, it shouldn't also be interacting via the strong force. So that rules out the gluon, and it again rules out all of these quarks that had already been ruled out to start with. Now, you might notice that there are those uh, cousins of the electron, the neutrinos, that uh, are still there in the game. Unfortunately, they're not heavy enough to make up dark matter. Uh, and so those also get ruled out. And you notice that there's still two guys left, uh, but these guys actually are not stable. So dark matter existed way in the early universe. It still exists today. These particles decay extremely quickly, so they don't exist for very long, and therefore they can't be dark matter either. So there's nothing in the standard model that can be dark matter. So, okay, what are the candidates? Well, if you've been to some of these public lectures before, you've probably heard of some of these candidates in the past. So here is another scale, now in terms of mass in these fancy electron volt units. So let's start with this range over here. The proton weighs 1 GeV in this uh, unit scale, and so it sits sort of roughly over here. And so we have proton-like dark matter candidates known as WIMPs, which live roughly in that range. And that's something that many people have gone after experimentally uh, in experiments here, for example, like Super CDMS, but also at the LHC, they go after these WIMP dark matter candidates. Now, way up here on this broken scale, uh, you also have uh, PBHs, and here you have electrons. So if we take the electron as its, uh, and, and its mass of roughly 1 in 2,000 the mass of the proton, we can also find dark matter candidates living around that mass range as well. And very creatively, we basically just took the neutrinos, made new ones, made them heavier, and said, OK, that could be dark matter. So those guys would sit roughly in this mass range over here between sort of one millionth and one thousandth the mass of a proton. If we were to take uh, stellar-sized objects and think about those as being possibly uh, dark matter candidates, so here around the mass of 30 times the mass of the sun, we could have primordial black holes as dark matter. So this would be black holes formed by those quantum fluctuations in that early universe space-time that I showed you way, way back in uh, a few earlier slides. Uh, and those could have developed into what we call primordial black holes, and those could also be dark matter. And those would live in a completely different mass range from the rest of these candidates. Then there's another dark matter candidate which is particularly uh, well-loved, which is the axion. And so here there was an image of uh, a logo of an experiment that I will go into a little bit more detail on later on. But this is where an axion could live, and this is now way, way, way lighter than the mass of a proton. So these were the old candidates, but there are actually new ideas about what dark matter could be, and those are the ones that I actually want to focus on. And in particular, I want to question that assumption that dark matter couldn't experience electromagnetic interactions, that it could not talk to photons. It turns out, actually, that as long as you dial the charge of this dark matter way, way down, it can still be dark matter. So the charge of this particle, which I'm going to label epsilon, would have to be much, much smaller than the charge of an electron. And these could be produced, for example, in the early universe via collisions of electrons and positrons that would just produce this milli-charged dark matter in collisions occurring many, many times early in the universe. So given this potentially new dark matter candidate, you might ask, OK, well, how are we going to go about uh, observing it, discovering it? Well, we can borrow intuition from the known charged particles. So again, let's take our, our positrons, so our positively charged electrons, and think about what they do if we were to stick a big magnet next to them. So if I took a big magnet and placed it in the middle of this room, and then I fired positrons at it, they would get deflected. 
So if you remember your right-hand rule from uh, electromagnetism 101, you can see that they're going to go either towards or away from uh, the board, depending on the direction of the magnetic field and the charge of the particle. And indeed, this is the same phenomenon that they use uh, just uh, over in LCLS, where they use magnets to accelerate uh, electrons and positrons. So, okay, we have this intuition that we know how to deflect charged particles. So maybe we can deflect these millicharged particles as well. So let's assume that now we have a bath of dark matter all around us, which we do because our galaxy lives in one of these clumps of dark matter. And let's assume that we can somehow get that dark matter to flow through our magnet and therefore get deflected. And I'll get to what we're going to do with that deflection in just a moment. So that dark matter is going to flow through our big deflecting magnet and it's going to move apart. But you might say, hang on a minute, how do you get the dark matter to flow through your deflector in the first place? And so then how are you going to be able to do that and then detect the deflection? So that's where streams come into play and where the general flow comes from. So here's our galaxy sitting in our big overdense clump of dark matter that formed very, very early in the universe. Uh, and that's sort of a, a slice on the side. But if we were to look at it in a slightly more 3D-ish picture, or at least as 3D as I can make it, this is what we would see. So we would see a disk of the galaxy that is encased in a sphere of dark matter. So the galaxy gets flattened out into a disk because it has these interactions that allow it to sort of flatten out like a pancake. So if you're imagining you're making a pizza and you twirl around the, uh, the dough, it's going to flatten out into a disk. That is exactly what happens with stars as well. They twirl around and they flatten out into these beautiful structures with the spiral arms. The dark matter, on the other hand, doesn't twirl around and flatten out. It stays in that initial sphere. And so that dark matter is just, sit, is just there as a sphere encapsulating our galaxy. And we're sitting nicely on one of these spiral arms trying to observe it. So what does this have to do with being able to chuck dark matter through our deflector? Well, we're spinning, right? So the galaxy is spinning around its central axis, and we're nicely sitting on this spiral arm. And so that means we're also spinning around the center of the galaxy through the dark matter. And we're actually spinning through all of this dark matter at roughly 100 kilometers per second. That's pretty damn fast. So we're going to be able to leverage the fact that the dark matter is not really moving relative to us, but we're certainly moving relative to the dark matter. And in fact, we're zipping through it all the time. So that's the dark matter that's just sitting there in our spherical, what we call halo, around our galaxy. But there's additional structures of dark matter that came about due to late time structure formation, so structures that formed much, much closer to the time that we are now rather than billions of years ago. So for example, you can get structures forming due to smaller structures, like here a dwarf galaxy, that came in to contact with our galaxy, collided with it, and got tidally stripped. So here's our, us sitting on the spiral arm of our galaxy, and let's see what happens if we chuck a dwarf into the galaxy. So it, it interacts with our galaxy, and it gets tidally stripped. It gets stretched out and smeared out across the sky. And so you observe this stream of particles uh, with its own accompanying dark matter, which I've tried to show here in a slightly different shade of gray, that is also getting smeared out. And indeed, we observe many of these streams. Uh, and here is a, a pretty picture of one known uh, with the fantastic name of GD1. Uh, so here is a, an observation of a bunch of stars that came from one of these collisions of a dwarf with our galaxy that got tidally stripped, and all of these stars got smeared out across the sky. So I chose this one to show you because there's other interesting things that might have to do with dark matter involved with it. But I just wanted to motivate that there are also these streams of dark matter that are also moving through uh, the galaxy at a very large speed. And indeed, there's actually a stream very near to us. So now we return to that picture of our deflecting magnet and our dark matter that has a very, very small charge with uh, electromagnetism. And now we flip that picture around, right? We're no longer chucking the dark matter into our deflector, but rather because we 
on the Earth in the solar system are orbiting around the center of our galaxy, we are actually flowing through the dark matter itself and thereby deflecting it. And so I've said all of this about deflecting dark matter and gone through this rigmarole of trying to explain why there is actually a relative motion of us and the dark matter. But what do we want to do with this? Well, when you separate charges, uh, what you actually get is light being emitted by these charges. So charges don't like to be separated apart. If you, ch if you separate out an electron and a positron, it tries to come back together because opposites attract. And they do that by exchanging photons. So that's exactly the same thing that would happen if you were to separate millicharged dark matter. So if you separate it out, they try to come back together, and they do this by emitting these photons. And so we, as the uh, canny observer, will try and observe the effect of this splitting. So what we did in a recent paper, and here I'll show you a, a technical plot, which I, you shouldn't try to understand what is going on here except for the colors. So the, here is our central deflector, which I pictorially represented with that magnet flowing through the dark matter. And you see that as it flows through it, it induces sort of these separations of charges that will shine, right? So here you can see that very, in the wake of that deflector, you get a big effect shown by this deep red color. And it dies off as you get further away from the deflector. And so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and observe that separation of these dark matter charges. So in practice, what we're going to do is not use a magnet, but rather use a big sphere, so a big sphere of charge. Let's imagine we've taken a sphere with positive charges on the outside and negative charges on the inside, and we're going to flow through that through our dark matter. So now instead of that separation I showed you earlier, the negative charge in the middle attracted all of the positively charged uh, dark matter particles, and the positive charges on the outside attracted all of the negatively charged particles, again inducing this separation of the dark matter charges that are exchanging these photons. And so what we're going to do with this is actually flip the sign of that sphere that I showed you 100,000 times per second, and this will induce basically a flipping of the sign of the charges that are being separated from plus to minus to plus to minus, and this will induce a large exchange of photons. Well, not very large, but large enough that we can observe it using an ultra-sensitive antenna. So this ultra-sensitive antenna would be hooked up to a, a detector with the fantastic name of SQUID. <laughs> so a SQUID stands for Superconducting Quantum Interferometric Device, and it's basically a device that measures very, very small magnetic fields. So these photons, remember, are associated with electromagnetism. They are the particle that induce the exchange of the electromagnetic force. And so that means that there's also magnetic fields and indeed electric fields associated with these photons being exchanged by those millicharged particles. And those can be measured using this ultra-sensitive squid. So it's not your garden variety antenna, but rather it's something that looks a little bit more like this, although bigger. So this is the prototype for the dark matter radio experiment, which I flashed very early on uh, this logo here when I was discussing other dark matter candidates. It's actually looking for axions. But what we realize is that actually it could be used as the detector for those deflections of those millicharged dark matter particles that I was telling you about. So if we now look at the experimental prospects, we see that we have this complicated looking plot where here along the uh, bottom axis, I'm showing you the mass of our dark matter as a function of the mass of the proton. So at the top here is one-tenth of the mass of the proton, and at the bottom here is one in a billion times the mass of the proton. So these dark matter particles would be very, very light. And here we see the charge compared with the charge of an electron. And we're starting at roughly one in a billion and going down to one in a billion squared. So one in a billion billion times the charge of a, uh, an electron. So it's effectively not charged in terms of observing it, which is why it remains dark as we try to observe galaxies and clusters of galaxies, but it would still interact with those photons. The gray regions are regions that are already ruled out by other experiments or observations, and this sort of bluish region is a region that's particularly interesting theoretically. 
Just for reference, if we were to take an electron and it put its mass on this scale, it would sit roughly here. And this is what you could do if you took the dark matter radio experiment and just put it in the wake of that deflecting electric field. That doesn't look tremendously great. But that's because dark matter radio is actually optimized for looking for magnetic fields. If instead we build a new dark matter radio to look for electric fields, now we're talking. Now we can actually probe a large chunk of the parameter space of this dark matter candidate and indeed a lot of the region that is theoretically very interesting, but also these other regions where people haven't really thought too hard about what dark matter could be living there. So this is something that hopefully uh, you should stay tuned, will uh, appear at Slack in the future. So that brings me, unfortunately, to the conclusions, which are, where are we with these fundamental questions uh, that we uh, discussed right at the very beginning. So I would like to argue that uh, the question of what are we has been fairly conclusively answered, and indeed many of the answers came through experiments here at Slack, like the discoveries of the, uh, some quarks and uh, the tau lepton. I would also argue that we know, at least in the cosmological sense, how we got here. So we know that all of the forces that we discussed in the early part of the talk played an important role. We also know that these dark matter uh, clumps in these gravitational wells also played an important role in where we've got here in this galaxy, in this cluster of galaxies. I think we obtained a partial answer to the question, why are we here? And hopefully you've all come away with the conclusion that dark matter certainly played a crucial role in explaining why we got to this point uh, here today. Although, of course, the, the grander question of why we're here, I'm not going to touch with a 10-foot barge pole. Where are we going? Well, that one gets sort of a red tick, because there's an idea of where to go, but we haven't really started. So we have this idea for detecting this new dark matter candidate, which would have a very, very small electric charge. But the next steps are going to be difficult ones. We have to make the experiment, and then we have to take a lot of data and get a lot of sensitivity. But hopefully, this is something that will be coming to a slack near you in the near future. So that concludes everything that I had to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. All right, we have time for a few questions. So um, what we will do is notice that there are microphones at the uh, tables. If you are recognized, please push the button, the little bar on the microphone, and you can start speaking. So maybe we can start with the gentleman in a gray hat. Go ahead. Um, where on the electromagnetic spectrum are these photons? Are, th are they dark photons or regular photons? So, so, so they're regular photons, uh, and indeed the, uh, the signal uh, would be at this frequency, so it would be at 100 kilohertz. Uh, so that's a little bit below radio in the spectrum. So, so dark matter radio is a radio in some sense, but ours is even more of a radio. <laughs> Very sensitive radio. Go ahead. Um, can you please talk more about the experimentation that's to come? You know, what's the time frame? How difficult is it going to, is it going to be? Uh, yeah. So. The, uh, the time frame is that we, we really just put out this paper uh, in August, uh, and it usually takes sort of order of years to actually go from a theoretical paper on an idea of how to detect dark matter to an implementation. Um, the next steps are to find an experimental group that are willing to spend five years of their lives doing the experiment. Uh, and in that regard, you know, we've already made some approaches both here at Slack and also at other labs. Uh, and then, of course, there's the eternal funding question, but we hope that all of these can be resolved and uh, we can get moving as soon as possible. Uh, so hopefully, in, in, if you ask me that question again in 10 years, we will either have made a discovery or we will have placed a new constraint on that plot that I showed you. All right, go ahead. Um, have there been any like recent like sci-fi movies that use dark matter as a subject or like the plot of the you know, film that is somewhat accurate. Uh, sorry, can you just put your hand up? I can't see where you are. 
I'd like to see. Oh, you. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of movies that have dark matter in them. Uh, probably most of them are very inaccurate. Uh, I haven't watched all of them, so I wouldn't know uh, specifically which ones would be more or less accurate. But my guess is that most of them are very inaccurate. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, lady in a blue shirt, please. Can you turn yourself, please? Thank you. Um, I wanted to know, you showed the prototype of the detector. Yes. Is it in process of being built? And I had a second question about the millicharged dark matter. Are those little particles theoretical and you're looking for them? Or do have you seen that those millicharged particles yet? Uh, so, so we have not seen millicharged particles yet. So I'm going to answer your questions back to front. Uh, the prototype, uh, which of course I skipped back, uh, which I will show again here, is one that the, the dark matter radio experimentalists have already built. Uh, so that's why the, there's a photo of it. And actually, I, I failed to mention, so thank you for drawing our attention back to this. This dark matter radio is an experiment being done here at Slack. Uh, so this was an, a nice way of trying to repurpose something that was already ongoing at Slack and, and use it for a different purpose. So, so this is their prototype, and, and they've actually received funding now to, uh, to do R&D, so research uh, for, for a one-meter cubed guy. So that would be sort of uh, a little bit smaller than this podium uh, for detecting axions. And you could also use that for our purposes, but as I showed you, the, the constraint or the detection pro prospects for that are not terribly great. But actually, the, the sort of stronger line that I showed you would also be in an experimental apparatus about the size of this podium. So it doesn't require these big underground mines or the LHC that's huge, right? It was 10,000 times bigger than us in, in length uh, to detect, to possibly detect dark matter. You could do it in sort of this size. So and that's fewer sort of zeros there. in cost as well, right? Many fewer <laughs> zeros in cost, yes. Right. Okay, gentlemen uh, behind the lady, yeah, go ahead. You, indeed. Um, uh, so you're, description of the uh, experimental approach that you're proposing calls to mind uh, old experiments trying to discover the ether. <laughs> um, and I wonder if, if, if this is one of a whole series of experiments people are considering that are like the experiments that were done then where perhaps you might fire some uh, streams of matter in different directions looking to see how they are deflected by the rush of um, dark matter as we're passing through it. Yeah, so, so indeed there's, there's actually a lot of different ways you can leverage our flow through dark matter to try and discover it. Uh, you can also leverage the fact that we flow through many things to discover it. So in fact, gravitational waves were discovered using a very similar apparatus to the one that was attempted to di attempting to discover the ether. Uh, right? so, so this principle of just using the deflection of regular matter through some unobserved, otherwise unobserved matter is one that it's, it's fairly basic, right? You try and move something and you try and see if it moves, you observe that movement, then you've detected something, right? So, so yes, in that sense, it's, it's sort of akin to the ether. Um, but it, it's just a basic principle that we use uh, in detection strategies all the time. Uh, th there are other experiments uh, similar to actually gravitational wave experiments that look for other dark matter candidates, so using these interferometric devices as they're known. Uh, so if you want to ask me more questions about that later, I can certainly tell you more. All right, maybe we can go to the gentleman here and then, so go ahead. Hi, um, you, you mentioned the primordial black holes as a possible contender, is that still the case or? Uh, <laughs> it really depends on who you ask. Um, so I, I don't want to bash primordial black holes and I also don't necessarily want to promote them. The reason why I showed them was to show just the wide range of masses that could be, uh, that could have dark matter candidates hiding in there. Um, my personal feeling is that primordial black holes are probably not looking so good right now, uh, but things can always change. And indeed, in the, the recent past, constraints on primordial black holes have been revisited and have gotten less tight than they were previously in uh, certain regions of the mass uh, range that they could exist in. Uh, so, so things do tend to move 
although more often than not, they move in the worse off, not better off direction. Um, yeah. I think there was one more question there. OK, go ahead in the back. Um, what happens if one of these particles falls into a black hole or gets ca can they be captured by planetary bodies? Is there like additional mass associated with astronomical objects from captured dark matter? So, so uh, I think there's two parts to your question. One is can these things be captured by big uh, astronomical objects? And the answer is of course yes. Uh, right, so if dark matter interacts with nothing except gravity, it would already accumulate, right? As we discussed, it, it sort of accumulates in these regions of under-dense uh, space-time. Uh, and so, so you would actually expect, certainly, that uh, dark matter would accumulate in the centers of stars or even in the center of the Earth. Uh, and there are lots of people, including some of my colleagues here at Slack in the theory group uh, and probably also at KAIPAC, who have considered the signatures of uh, accumulation of dark matter at the centers of, uh, of celestial bodies. Uh, and you can also produce them in celestial bodies. So in fact, one of the, uh, the constraints here, this big region here that is grayed out, comes from uh, the non-observation of the production of these particles in stars. Uh, so stars would just be able to produce them, regardless of whether they were dark matter or not. They would just be emitted, and stars would lose energy. Uh, and so the fact that there are stars that are still extant now that could have been emitting these stars and uh, these particles and therefore losing energy places this constraint here. Uh, so yeah, they certainly do get absorbed and there's certainly lots and lots of signatures associated with that absorption and emission in, in astronomical objects. I have a question right here. <coughs> Observations in, uh, from the 19th century that couldn't be explained by Newtonian cosmology were eventually explained with relativity. Uh, is there any prospect for there being an update to theory that um, solves the unexplained observations, uh, but without dark matter, or dark energy for that matter? Is that possible yeah, so, still? So, so uh, part, part of the reason why in my motivation for dark matter I spent so much time on the cosmic microwave background and on structure formation is because unlike the rotation curves, these cannot be explained using modified gravity. So modified gravity supporters always point to rotation curves, and sometimes they can also explain the bullet cluster. And they say, oh, look, if we just modify gravity on certain length scales, you can explain all of this very nicely. But they cannot explain the cosmic microwave background, nor can they explain the structure formation that we observe simultaneously with everything else. So I would say with almost 100% certainty that modifying Newtonian dynamics is not going to be the solution to this, unfortunately. And in fact, many people who work on modified Newtonian dynamics today include some amount of dark matter to try and explain the cosmic microwave background. So you're almost back where you started. All right. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, experimentally, how did you come up with 100 kilohertz as a, a sweet spot? It seems like a noisy Very place good. to be trying to see things. Very good. So. Uh, the size of the signal grew with frequency, so we wanted to go to higher frequencies as much as possible. Uh, but there's actually a cutoff at about a megahertz. Uh, so if, if you oscillated the electric field at a megahertz, uh, the dark matter wouldn't pass through the detector before you flipped the sign. And so you would actually start to reduce the size of the signal. So that was the, the upper limit. And then just to be on the safe side, we pick 100 kilohertz. But we'll try and push that as close to the, the upper limit as possible. All right. I see one more question there. Go ahead. Yeah, if you think about the sphere of dark matter around our galaxy and this collapsed into this sphere, it seems like by conservation of angular momentum, it would have to be rotating or very likely be rotating. And shouldn't it form more of a disk shape than a sphere because of that? So, so the disk shape actually occurs because there's additional forces that allow for dissipation of energy before you dissipate the angular momentum. Uh, so, so in that analogy of the, uh, the pizzaiolo making his pizza and spinning around the dough, uh, there there's just one force at play, right? It's just the fact that it just gets stretched out because of the rotation. Here there's not just gravity, but there's also electromagnetism in particular. And electromagnetism allows regular 
uh, matter to dissipate a lot of that energy before it dissipates the angular momentum. So it's left with most of that energy in the form of angular momentum and just spins out and flattens out. Uh, dark matter, because it only interacts gravitationally, or at least if it has interactions, they're extremely small, right? Uh, then it, it's not able to lose that energy so efficiently early on. And so it doesn't lose, uh, it loses most of its energy just through gravitational dissipation, which tends not to flatten things out, actually. It just sort of, if you think about a superposition of di disks, if you add enough of them together, they're just going to form a sphere, right? All right, I don't see any more hands up. Oh, one more. Uh, is the milli charge dark matter your idea? No. <laughs> okay. How, how long ago did it, was it proposed? Uh, that's a good question. So there are certainly papers from the early 90s where people discussed milli charged dark matter, uh, but there it was actually not milli charged. It was uh, charges of order one, but it was just much, much heavier. Uh, and so then that sort of morphed continuously over time into uh, this region of mass and charge space that I showed you here. Um, most ideas don't come out of vacuum, right? They sort of start as a different idea that is maybe roughly the same, but somewhat continuously de deformable into a new idea. Uh, and that's generally how things happen. All right, maybe at this point we should uh, finish our uh, formal questions and there will be probably a bit of time for us to uh, chat outside. I think we have to vacate this room pretty soon, so that's one of the reasons. So let's thank Sebastian again for a very exciting talk. Thank you.